The political reason not to do it is I can get away with it now. But if I live in a society where this is allowed, where mm -hmm. the other guy's rights are not protected, some guy is going to do it to me. There's always mm -hmm. somebody smarter than you. There's always somebody more conniving and more than you are, right? And they're the one who are going to go after, they'll come after you. So you, you, you're you far better off living in a society where everybody's rights are protected, including your own, mm -hmm. than living in a society in which rights are not protected. And therefore, you can be easily the victim of the next guy who comes after you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the real issue, you know, only in, only in movies do bad guys live good lives. Right. Oh, that's beautifully said. Um, there, something that really resonated with me from Jordan Peterson was he said in his 25 years, I think of clinical psychology, he said he never saw anyone get away with anything. And that was so I powerful. Mean? And then he, actually, and maybe I would like to ask you this, that he described it as this twisting of the moral fabric of reality that inevitably snaps back to hurts you. Is this something Rand would agree with that, that the moral fabric of existence is something objectively true? So there's no say, so she would reject the idea of a moral fabric, okay. but she would say morality is objectively true. Okay. And when you go against morality, right? I, now I would define morality very differently than Jordan Peterson. So we're not talking about the same thing, yeah. but generally if morality is objectively true, and when you go against it, you will suffer the consequences. In that yeah. sense, it'll snap back and get you, right? right. So um, my favorite, one of my favorite, I think maybe my favorite talk that Jordan ever gave is a talk where he talks about why lying doesn't work. And he does it with Pinocchio. Remember, he, has, he does this class where he uses Pinocchio, the movie, yeah. to illustrate, talk about lying. And it's brilliant. And he's absolutely right on that, that lying doesn't work. Now, Jordan and I would disagree on the purpose of thou shalt not lie in a sense, the, the, purpose, the, the, the issue of honesty, because he is conventional in his morality in a sense that, again, it comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's yeah. about others. I say don't lie primarily because it hurts yourself. Yeah. Now he knows that and, he, and it's in that talk, but that's not his emphasis. So I love some things that Jordan does and I deeply dislike other things he does, okay. but I, I always find him interesting. Um, but Rand would definitely say morality is objective and that's in the virtue of selfishness. And if you violate the principles of morality, reality will snap back at you and you will not be happy. Happiness requires commitment to morality, which means commitment to reality, which means commitment to reason. So for, and I've come to this perspective through my studies that the, the modern materialist viewpoint on reality is, um, let's say a bit flawed or there's some trade-offs to it a bit would Rand consider, cause I think this is a key point. Mo most materialists would consider morality as a subjectively, I, I, I choose my own morality. You choose your own morality. Hopefully we sync up. Yeah. Would Rand actually say then that no morality is as true as an atom or something like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. But, but, but it's not an atom in the sense that it's an existent out there. Like right. for Jordan, morality exists out there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same as an atom in the sense that it's objectively, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's true. It's objectively true. But morality is at the higher level of abstraction than an atom, right? Because mm -hmm. an atom is observable directly. Wow. Morality is something that you would have to. It's metaphysical. Stop. No, morality is not metaphysical. No, not metaphysical. Adam is metaphysical. Okay. Morality is more epistemological in the sense that you have to abstract to it. Mm. You have to reach that abstraction. It's not about morality is not out there and I need to go discover it. Morality mm -hmm. is something I have to discover through observing what works and what doesn't. So morality mm -hmm. is an abstraction of human behavior of the things that work right. towards human success, towards human flourishing. That is what morality is. So, you know, Jordan talks about uh, uh, things having existent, abstractions having existence in the world. And Rand says, no, they don't have existent in the sense that there's that abstraction lives there, right? It doesn't. It lives in here. 
that doesn't make it subjective because it's based on facts about things that actually right. exist right. out there, right? Yes. So I'm abstracting yeah. from the existence that are in reality. So is then the Christian tradition or the Bible more specifically, is this just charting the discovery of morality? Because when you read from something like the Old Testament into the New Testament, yeah. the, the morality is becoming more refined, much more well, I, individualistic. I'd say, I'd say it's changing dramatically. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd say there's big changes because God, because the, the people need different things, right? So um, the Jews need a morality to give them strength to, um, to get out of slavery, to conquer a land, to annihilate the people they need to annihilate and to be strong leaders in a strong state. I mean, the Old Testament is about statism. It's about establishing a state. Mm -hmm. The New Testament is for people who are meek, who are powerless, mm -hmm. who are under the thumb of the Romans. So it is written from the perspective of, of weakness and how to survive being weak, right? So it's giving different moral guidance to different people in different, completely different contexts. But th this is the thing about, uh, about the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, people need morality. They need morality in the sense that they need um, a guidance. This is right. This is wrong. We all need that. Everybody, even people who deny it, they need it. They, you can't at, at every single moment accumulate all the empirical evidence and decide what you're going to. You can't do that. You have to live by some principles. Mm -hmm. and, and those principles can be explicit. You can hold them. You know what they are. You can understand them. You can prove them to yourself. Or they might be implicit, but we all have that. Religion gives guidance. I don't think the guidance is very good. I, I don't think the guidance is right. I don't think morality, quadruple Christian morality is true. Mm. I think it's flawed. I think it's wrong. And of course, again, the Christians and the Jews don't agree. Mm -hmm. I, I was I just did an interview. I know you've been on Lex Friedman show. I just, just did a thing with Lex Friedman and a guy named Yoram Chazoni. And Yoram is a religious Jew. He wears a yarmulke. And, and uh, so Lex asked Yoram, he says, what, what, what does Judaism say about turning the other cheek? And Yoram said, we don't believe in turning the other cheek. Absolutely not. Never. Right? We don't turn the other cheek. So that's the Old Testament versus the New Testament, right? It's very different. Mm -hmm. It's guidance. It's wrong. Both, I think, are wrong. And what Ayn Rand is trying to discover is a true morality based on reason, based on observation of actual facts of reality. That in religion does the same thing. It just it's more primitive because it it's, was written three thousand years ago. They did the best job they could, I think. Mm -hmm. But it was it was it was put together, I think, by human beings. Uh, philosophers, the equivalent of philosophers of the time, who tried to create something that would guide people to the best of their ability, but their ability is limited mm -hmm. because their knowledge was limited. The more knowledge we have, the more refined our ability to really come up with a proper guide to how to live. And that's mm -hmm. what, you know, that's what Rand tries to do in her, in her moral writings. Wow. Okay. So, Wow. But then, as you said earlier, she couldn't have written it had she not been on the other side of the Industrial Revolution. So there's this ongoing refinement process. That so There's an ongoing refinement process. There's no question about that. So, so yeah. truth is always conditional on the context in which you are, right? On what you know. You can't know what you don't know. Yeah. So based on everything that I know, this is the truth. Yeah. Well, you don't have to say every time based on everything that I know, because when you say this is the truth, Implicit in that statement is based on everything that I know. What I don't know, I don't know. You know, yeah. aliens might arrive tomorrow and tell us that, you know, we're wrong about evolution. You know, human beings are, are transplants from some other planet. And, yeah. and that's why human beings are so different than apes. I don't, I mean, I think that's, there's no, there's no reason to believe any of that. But something like that could happen. And, yeah. But for, for what we know today, evolution is true based on everything we know today. It's yeah. always, but based on everything we know today is behind every statement of truth. Right. Got it. Okay. Uh, we're at like an hour and a half. Do you want to do a five minute break? I'm good. You're good to go. Good. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. The other thing I think that's really, there's just an interesting connection here and I'm just kind of waxing philosophical with you, but 
Yeah. Peterson describes too, like the fall of man in the Bible as being equivalent to something like the discovery of time. And it seems to me that there's this, yeah the idea of reason itself is kind of like that too. Like we start to observe ourselves, not just in the moment, but across time, both backwards and planning forwards. No, this so, is, this is great. Yeah. Because what, what is that connection? I'm just... So let me first deal with Peterson's view of the fall of man. Cause it's really interesting. Uh, and my view of the fall of man, which is very different. Um, and then the connection, I mean, Time, we understand time through reason. I mean, there's, there's no other way to, to get time. Uh, but, you know, in the Garden of Eden, uh, you know, we, we're just there. In the Garden of Eden, we're animals. Mm. We have no reason. We don't think. We don't plan for the future. We don't produce. We don't do science. We don't, we don't even have sex. We, we literally do nothing. We sit around all day. We eat. When the food is available, we tend to the garden, but we, we don't do much. I mean, if you read the descriptions of the Garden of Eden, it's like it's it's a mindless, dull, boring, quote, paradise. Right? Mm -hmm. What it really is describing is animals without reason and with no free will. And then notice that Eve goes and eats from what? From the tree of knowledge. Think about the tree of knowledge, that evolutionary whatever that made reason and free will possible. She bites into it and, and Adam bites into it. And suddenly they were aware of themselves and of the world around them, of their nudity, which means I think of their sex and the sexual attraction. They're suddenly human beings. They're not just animals anymore. That tree, of, but it's the tree of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. That's the link to, to reason. Mm -hmm. And so the fall of man, which is the fall from, from the Garden of Eden, is the discovery of reason. Mm -hmm. And that's not a fall. That's the greatest thing that's ever happened, in, as far as I know, <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in the history of the universe, right? Suddenly, we've created this being that is aware, self-aware, aware of, the, of, of, of what's going on around him, mm -hmm. can think, can produce. Uh, God says you have to now go and, and, and work. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, work is not toil. Work is good. Work is the way we express our reason in the world. We shape our environment to fit our needs. So, and, and it, what's sad, I think, in the world today is that people long for the Garden of Eden. They want some place. I mean, Marx's utopia is like this, and you get every utopian vision and just people who don't do a lot of thinking. They want a place where everything's provided for them. They don't have to work. They don't have to think. They don't have to desire. They don't have to have a, an, an idea, but, but to anybody who's really alive, that sounds like the most boring, horrible place possible. I don't want to be an animal. I want to be a human being. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, the fall is us becoming human beings by gaining the faculty of reason. Mm -hmm. And time is, is just an aspect of that. Yes, there's no time in, 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 in the Garden of Eden. But, but suddenly when, when we, when we uh, discover reason, we discover our own mortality, because we can think about it. We can plan for it. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to die. Animals don't know they're going to die. They just die. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to die. We can right. observe death and we can extrapolate that it's going to happen to us. That's an induction. Yeah. You know, uh, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, right. Socrates is mortal. So we can induce and deduce that we're going to die too. And now we have a perspective on time. Okay, I'm, I'm alive today. I'm going to die. What do I do about it? See, Jordan, and this is the differences. Jordan views that as tragic. I don't view that as tragic. Of course, we're going to die. All beings die. All biological beings die. Okay, how do I make, I've got, I've got, you know, I'm older, so I've got 20, 30 years left. How do I make the most of that, right? I don't view my death as tragic. I view my death as just a reality. And the real question is, how am I going to live? What am I going to do in the next 20, 30 years to make my life the best damn life I can make it? Because I know I'm going to die. So I don't sit around moping about death. I sit around focused on trying to figure out the best way to make the best life possible over the next X number of years. Right. Wow. Okay. So that's it. That's interesting. It makes a lot of sense connecting it to the tree of knowledge in that way. And then again, if we're, if you're using reason to 
write or draw a higher resolution map of reality, clearly you would discover time in that sense. You would see more of what is. Yep. Um, he, so the other philosophical point he makes here is that also in that discovery, what he calls the discovery of time, we could say is the discovery of reason, that man, and this is implicit into the, the story as well, like can now discern between good and evil. And so he can actually choose to do evil. Is that a product of reason as well that we can infer? We can almost like deduce, hey, this hurts me. So yes. that guy is a person too. This would probably hurt him. And then I could apply my reason uh, malevolently, I suppose, to you know torture or, or whatever the guy. So, How does so evil I fit into this picture? So evil fits in. Evil is death. Evil is that which leads to death. Evil is that which leads to destruction. Now, I don't know that in the moment that human beings wake up, you know, become human, whatever that moment is, the fall, um, they discover reason. They know what's good and what's bad. Mm -hmm. They need now to go out and live and experience and test and figure stuff out. And really morality, morality is a product, you know, let's say human beings became conscious reasoning beings 100,000 years ago. It, it might have been a million years ago. I don't know exactly what the number is. Morality is young, right? Mm -hmm. Morality is probably only 10,000 years old mm -hmm. because it took them a lot of time to test, to kill, to, to... And look, again, morality for me is not what you do to other people primarily. It's what you do with yourself. Mm. It's how you spend your time. To me, it's immoral, for example to mope around all day and do nothing. And, and you know, unless you're resting, right? But if, you know, we know people who just sit in their mother's basement and play video games all day and they, they do nothing productive, right? That's immoral. Not because they're hurting anybody else, but because they're hurting themselves. Mm. And the primary person you, this is the selfishness, the primary person you should be taking care of is you. So morality should be concerned. The whole point of morality is to teach us how to live. Mm -hmm. Give us the principles. We've been around for 100,000 years. What have we learned in the last 100,000 years? What leads to happiness? What leads to death? What leads to destruction? That's what morality, that's what Ayn Rand does. She takes all the things we learned and gives us principles based on the things we've learned that leads us to life versus, and she says, avoid all these things that lead to death. And, and uh, you know, maybe Cain has to kill Abel to figure out that killing is bad. It's right. not like morality exists Again, independent of our um, uh, understanding it, right? We, we have to understand. Uh, we have to comprehend it. We have to figure it out. It, it, it doesn't just, it, yeah. we have to discover it. It doesn't just appear to us. It, it, it's not the word of God. That's not morality. Morality is something we need to discover. Let me, let me ask you this further question then. So you, evil is that which leads to death, but it seems like evil can be even more nefarious than that where i think of like in the uh jewish internment camps they had the work will set you free thing yeah. and they were literally they just made people carry the sandbags back and forth right like they could have just killed them and be sure. done with it that would have been one degree of evil but it seems like there was this intentional suffering imposed on others so what is that all about because it's not just about death that's about well, some sadistic it, pleasure it, or something yeah, so 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 evil by its evil by its nature is leads to death, but mm -hmm. it can lead to death through a lot of paths. It mm -hmm. can lead to death very slowly. It can lead to death very fast. And there's certain human beings, um, you know, who can who get satisfaction in some superficial way out of uh, you know the sadists, and they get satisfaction out of seeing other people hurting. Other people suffering, particularly one, one of the important things the Nazis did, and they, and they spent a lot of resources on this, is dehumanizing Jews. Mm -hmm. So the people in the concentration camp were not human to them. It was like rats. Right. And they were torturing rats. And torturing rats is bad enough. I'm not for torturing rats. No. But it's easier to torture a rat than it is to torture a human being if, you're, if you've got any decency in you, right? Right. You still shouldn't torture rats either. Yeah. But it's easier. So first they dehumanize Jews and then they torture them. And, you know, it takes a certain level of sickness and disgust and horror to 
embrace that, to embrace right. suffering. And, and uh, you know, again, Jordan Peterson has this thing where he says, everybody could be a Nazi, right? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, we could all be Nazis, any one of us. I don't think that's true. Very few people could be Nazis. Hmm. And, and the historical fact is that, you know, most people were not guards at the concentration camps. Most people did everything they could not to be, do that. Um, it's the tiniest minority who are actually willing to do the horrible things mm -hmm. that, for example, Nazis did. We, we're very good at evading that. We might know it's happening and not want to not want to do anything about it. And that's mm -hmm. a, that's also evil in some sense. But to actually engage in evil activities, those kind of evil activities, very, very few human beings are capable of doing it. Mm. Is this dehumanization process, is this equivalent to inspiring the belief that those group of people over there don't have a reason? Yeah. Are you saying absolutely. we have reason and they don't? So they therefore don't. we need to- They're animals. They're animals. And therefore you can do whatever you want with them. And this is the, again, why reason is so crucial, why the whole idea of reason. So what do the, what do, what do the Nazis say? And the communists do the same thing. It's, a, it's an interesting trick. What they say is, Truth is only available to Aryans. Truth is only available to the Aryan race. Race determines truth. Jews cannot reason. Only Aryans can reason. And to them, reason means something else. Reason means to them discovery of truth. So the Aryan people are superior in some way. The primary way in which they're superior is they have a mystical connection to the truth. Uh, in communism, it's the proletarian. The mm -hmm. proletarian have some mystical connection to the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with those theories are, because those are theories philosophers come up with, is that, well, the fact is the Aryan people don't have any connection to the truth and the proletarian don't have any connection to the truth. So how are they supposed to know what they do? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you get dictatorships. That's why you have to have a dictator. The yeah. dictator is the representative of the group who connects with the world of spirits, who connects with the truth, Right. And then guides the masses towards that truth. And part of the truth is that the Jews don't have access to it. They'll never discover the truth. They don't have this form of reason, supposedly. They don't have this form of discovery truth. So therefore, they're just animals. And therefore, we can do whatever we want with them. That's why, uh, you know, the proletarian can kill as many people as they need in order to achieve the utopia. Because the people they're killing are not true human beings in some fundamental sense. Wow. They're not connected. And you think about Catholicism has this, you know, the Pope historically communes with God. Yeah. He's the only person on planet Earth that knows the truth. Conduit to truth. Now, if he really is the conduit to truth, then we're all his minions. We're nothings. We don't have reason. We just have to bow in front of him and do what he tells us. And that's the power of religion. That's the power of authoritarianism. That's the power of, of these of these this kind of philosophical idea it all goes back to Plato. Plato has this idea that only certain people, the philosopher kings, have access to the truth. Everybody else has no access to truth and cannot have access to the truth. And that's power. If you can convince millions of people they can never know the truth, they have to rely on you for the truth forever. They're your slaves forever. Right. Wow. I want to read this kind of chilling whitehouse.gov excerpt from a press release. We are intent on not letting Omicron disrupt work and school for the vaccinated. You've done the right thing and we will get through this. For the unvaccinated, you're looking at a winter of severe illness and death for yourselves, your families, and the hospitals you may soon overwhelm. Just this is why <laughs> government should never have anything to do with healthcare. Yeah. Leave us alone. You know, I, 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 you know, uh, there are plenty of scientists out there who can provide information. Uh, leave us alone. There's a, there's a small role for governments in pandemics. But other than that, we, we just uh, isolate people who really have the disease who might infect others when it's deadly. But questionable how deadly this is. And uh, uh, at least the, 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 this new variant, particularly if you, and then leave us alone. Let us decide if we want so to get can, vaccinated. How to get vaccinated? Can I ask you then? Is there, the in your estimation, a conscious attempt here to make 
or classify the unvaccinated as an unreasonable cohort of the population. Um, and, and I'm yeah. not trying to pick a side here, but it, the, the problem with that is they also keep changing the definition of unvaccinated. You could have well, had two and not I mean, three or four and not five. And you to keep- some extent, because the science, the facts change. So, uh, you know, the fact that they change yeah. their mind doesn't bother me that much because I, I understand the facts behind it and the facts, the, the reality does change. They're not, they're not omniscient. They're not, they don't know everything. They, they, they're going to have to, they're going to have to move as the virus moves. But yeah, there's no question that trying to, it's trying to create this view of the unvaccinated as monsters. The unvaccinated is irrational, uh, emotion-driven, unreasonable people. Um, and, and uh, you know, there are political reasons for that because most are unvaccinated Republicans. So this administration in particular has an interest in saying Republicans are irrational, crazy people because they're trying to get the independents to go against the crazies and to vote for them. So there's definitely a conscious effort to portray them. The problem with bad people is they're never conscious of how evil they really are. They're only conscious of it up to a point because you couldn't hold, you couldn't actually admit to the evil that you actually engage in. I mean, Hitler and people like that had to evade their own evilness, which mm-hmm. took a lot of work um, uh, to do because you can't face that in the mirror and, mm-hmm. and not commit suicide and not go crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yes, they're, they're definitely trying to dehumanize the unvaccinated. And this is why government has no business in all of this. I, and I'm hugely pro-vaccines, just away on the table. I think yeah. vaccines are great. You know, I'm going to get my booster next week. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the fact is that if uh, that if if it's right, people suffer the con. This is nature, right? This is a morality spring. What did you say? Springing back at you, right? If right. it's true that that the unvaccinated are taking their lives in their own hands, then they're taking their lives in their own hands, and they're going to suffer the consequences. And maybe many of them, many of them have already died, and many of them will die. Okay, that's their problem. It's not mine. It's not I, I, my job. Is not to save them from themselves. Um, my job is first and foremost to save myself. And to help the people I love and care for. And I can educate other people. I can help. I can articulate the case for vaccines, yeah. tell you why it's a good thing to get vaccinated. But at the end of the day, your life is yours, right? That's your the principle. Yeah. Your, cho- the your choice. Yeah. And if you choose to jump off a cliff without a parachute, I'm not going to stop you. I, I believe in the right to suicide. Uh, I believe in the right to kill yourself because that's what a right to life means. It means the right to, to live or not. Yeah. As the case may be. Yeah, I I agree with that completely. Um, yeah, okay. So, sorry to go down that dark turn there. I just it was coming to mind as we're yeah. describing this yeah. deep process of dehumanization, and I just I don't know. That was a kind of a creepy press release oh, from the White House. I mean, yeah, but if, if you that think came about out it, two years ago, I think people would have been up in arms. Yeah, but it did come out two years ago, just different, right? So think about think about how. Trump, from the moment he started running, worked to dehumanize immigrants. Mm, okay. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it was just unbelievable. And it was it was right along these paths. All your problems are caused by immigrants. There's carnage in the streets of America. We're living through the most peaceful period of all of American history, which was 2016, 2017. And yeah. he's saying carnage in the streets of America. Who caused by whom? By those open borders, by those immigrants, by those, ga- you know, and, and uh, you know, he, he made fun of a, a, a Hispanic judge. He just went on and on and on throughout mm-hmm. his, his term, dehumanizing immigrants. Now, we could have a debate about how much immigration makes sense or doesn't make sense or open borders or whatever. But that's not what he was doing. He wasn't having a discussion about it. He, he was treating them as subhuman. Right. And it, it was purposeful. It was it was it was a way in which to rail up. His audience, right? His audience right. got excited when he did that, um, and that's exactly denying them reason, denying them agency, denying them humanity, denying right. them humanity. Hey, everybody! As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century, and one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies 
to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. So, okay, that's a great point. Does is is this part and parcel to statism then to create these boogeymen and try to get people to act out of their emotional body versus their reason? Absolutely. So 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 look, in reason, um, we would be living in a very different country and a very different government. You know, the kind of government that's established from reason is the is the is the kind of government the founders established in this country. Mm-hmm. Very little power to mm-hmm. the government. Mm-hmm. Very minimal power, focus on individual rights. The role of government is to protect us. That's about it. And uh, separation of powers, lots of different things to make it, government as uh, power, as, as, as hard as possible for it to grow in terms of its power. Right. But we've long lost the funny fathers. Funny fathers are long yeah. dead intellectually as well as, as actually dead. Um, in order for the state to grow, it has to appeal to the anti-reason, which is emotion. Uh, it has to appeal to faith. It has to appeal to the idea that they know more than we do, that, um, that uh, uh, you know, they are philosopher kings mm-hmm. and we don't know how to live. And if we didn't have an FDA, we'd all die. And if we didn't have a CDC, we'd all die and we depend on them. And uh, if, if we just opened the borders, these people would, would take our jobs and they'd kill us all. They will lie on fear. They will lie on the idea that we they, they want to go back to the 15th century where people believe they didn't have the capacity to take care of themselves. They didn't have the capacity to think for themselves. They want to replace that. And the statists of left and right, and I don't differentiate between Democrats and Republicans here because they're all the same in the sense. Mm-hmm. They institute fear in, and then, they, you know, this is how Donald Trump ran his campaign. He was good at this. This is why I use him as an example, right? The world is falling apart. It's the end of times. Mm-hmm. Why? Not because of any choice you made. You're fine. It's because of Chinese, immigrants, and elites. If only we could get rid of them, implicit, mm-hmm. things would be fine. Who knows how to fix things? Who knows how to put them in their place? I do. Mm. You don't know how to do it. Mm. I do. Give me more power. I'll Mm, fix things. I'll take care of you. I am the benevolent caretaker. And that's how you get authoritarianism. That is the path to authoritarianism. So that's what I mean. That's the, uh, I guess, implicit behavior of anyone in that position of power is to try and invoke more divisiveness so they can justify obtaining more power to fix the divide in whatever way. and this goes back to the question, you know, this issue of morality, right? Because people say, look, they're, they're being selfish. I don't think politicians are selfish, right? Because they're miserable. They're all miserable. They live pathetic little lives. Uh, they, they're not happy. They're mm-hmm. not successful. They've never produced anything. They've mm-hmm. never built anything. They have no self-esteem. You can see it when they mm-hmm. when they talk and when they walk around. They're little miserable human beings. I used to go to Washington, D.C. and meet congressmen and senators when I used to be CEO of the Ironman Institute. People used to book me to meet them. And I did this a couple of times. I met, I don't know, quite a few senators and congressmen. And I told my people, I never want to meet another politician. I don't care mm-hmm. how big they are. Because they're nothings, they're zeros. Mm-hmm. And again, it doesn't, doesn't matter. They're not smart mm-hmm. and they're not successful and they're not interesting. And mm-hmm. why would I want to meet people like that? I, I love meeting business people, right? I love meeting scientists. I love meeting yeah. people who are doing things out there in the world who, have, who are making stuff and, and discovering stuff. These people are, are nothing. They're parasites. And it's... Um, they suffer the consequence of their own actions. They, you know, so reality works, the morality works to be truly selfish. 
you have to be rational. You have to use reason. You have to be productive. You have to be honest. You have to be a bunch of different things that politicians right. and crooks are not. Right. Wow. Okay. So that's great. It's the, almost as though the reason of politicians or crooks is not taken far enough, right? They take it to the edge of their own individual short-term self-interest. Like I'm going to go steal from so-and-so to enrich myself. But they're exactly. not considering the longer term implications, or the moral implications of their action. They can't. They can't think in, term, in those terms. They, I mean, they can, but they don't want to. And they, they don't let themselves go there. And of course, there are exceptions. I mean, I think the founding fathers were exceptions. They were exceptional people who used reason to think long term, structure government that they thought would sustain itself long term, limit its powers. But they, but they weren't, they didn't construct it perfectly because they came before the industrial revolutions. They right. didn't have the full scope of knowledge that was required in right. order to do the best so job possible. Are these these patterns of human action though, I I view them presently as like almost propagating through us, like through the incentives we face largely. They kind of sculpt how we act. And you mentioned earlier that we need, what we really need is a social institution of some kind that just preserves property, life, liberty, and property, and does nothing else. That's kind of the ideal exactly. government. Exactly. Um, that would both limit the growth of government and um, I guess the problem that I see happening is like, we've always, we've, we've always had this idea. It's like, okay, do that. We did that with America, but then that oh, idea turns see, we in haven't really. It starts to Even prey on the property it's, it's um, charged to protect. So but even the American, I, want to, I want to insert yeah. Bitcoin here as well as this social institution sure. of property that's at least really expensive to violate. Yep. Can this be the ground of a new incentive schema for a non-coercive state? I don't see how, because it's expensive, maybe more expensive to violate. So maybe you, you, you gain more time. But at the end of the day, expense is never the limit, right? Expense is not the issue. People are willing to go to the ends of the earth to do bad things, unfortunately. I mean, look at what Hitler did. Look at what Stalin did or Mao did. Look at what our status are doing today in a free, in a relatively free country. In a play, I mean, imagine what America would be today if we didn't have these, this, the status government. So I, I would argue that it's um, Bitcoin can save us, give us time, maybe. Again, and I don't have a deep understanding of Bitcoin. Maybe not deep, far from deep enough to to make definitive statements here, mm. but. The bigger point is, and why I'm not, a, you know, why I don't think government inevitably has to get to where it is today. First of all, you know, uh, uh, vigilance is required, right? You talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. you, you're not going to stay free unless you're vigilant. Mm -hmm. But second, if I wrote a constitution today, I bet I could get a, a few friends together and we could write a constitution that was better at preserving liberty than what the founding fathers did. Mm -hmm. Only because we have 250 years of experience with their constitution, we can now fine tune it. For example, I would have four sections, what I call the separation clauses. Mm -hmm. I would have a complete separation of state from economics. Mm -hmm. No economic policy. You don't print money. You don't mint money. You, you don't have any role in money except collecting taxes and taxes would have to be voluntary. They'd have to be a, a non-coercive way of raising taxes, mm -hmm. but they would be, that would be the only time you touch money. There's no, there's no right. other right. form in which you regulate control business at all. You're not in the business of business. One separation of state from education. See in America, Thomas Jefferson started the first public university. <laughs> so while he was, individual rights and all this limited government. Now let's get the government involved in education. Oh my God. You know, talk mm -hmm. about letting the fox into the, into mm -hmm. the, uh, chicken into coop. the chickens or whatever, chicken coop. So you don't want government in education. So separate government from education. Third, relevant to what you read about COVID, separate government from science. Mm -hmm. Government shouldn't have a food pyramid. It shouldn't have approved vaccines. It shouldn't have medical treatments that they say are okay or not okay. It's n they're not in the business of, of science, period. Mm -hmm. And then fourth, which is in the constitution, but I think weak, is a separation of state from ideas. Mm. Uh, religion, but ideas more broadly. The state is not 
pro-socialism or communism or capitalism or anything. It's there to protect individual rights. Now, I think that's capitalism, but mm -hmm. it's not promoting those ideas. It's not involved in those ideas. It doesn't test people on those ideas. Right. It, it just lets you live. So if we can have just those four separations. Now, yes, if people lost the vigilance, we would lose the freedom. But yeah. those make it harder yeah. to lose the vigilance. Could the scale and scope of Mao, Hitler, these other statist atrocities, could they have been as severe as they were without fiat currency? Yeah. Like I don't access see, well, to the, the I don't printer is what let them get, um, let them, let things go on much longer than they should have. I, I don't there, know if they it, should. There's but. a sense in which, a sense in which there was no real money in China, right? I mean, it, it, they were so poor, a lot of, a lot of stuff happened through barter. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, you, you, look, the, the printing press makes it all the worse because it, it's another form of control, mm -hmm. right? It's another, it's, and it's a form of control at the heart of property, at mm -hmm. the heart of our property rights and at the heart of voluntary transaction and, and trade, mm -hmm. which means that it's at the heart of the control of our quality of life and standard of living. Um, so, yes, I mean, but you can't imagine how, could you imagine a, a state that said, we control everything except money? I mean, <laughs> that, it's not going to happen. They would, they would rather shut down their electricity. Right. Then let yeah. you keep your money is my point. Right. This is why so you, uh, you, you know, think they'll it, take down the power grid permanently before they'd let something like Bitcoin succeed. When it, when it, when, it, if it ever, if we ever get to a point of authoritarianism, which I think we're heading towards, and they view Bitcoin as a mortal threat to their ability to control, absolutely. Globally. And would people rebel? Maybe it would be bloody, it would be difficult. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there are other ways short of taking down the power grid that they could hurt Bitcoin without destroying mm -hmm. it, right? Make it impossible for you to buy stuff in the physical world with it. Mm -hmm. Make it illegal for you to buy stuff in the digital world with it. They couldn't really control that. You'd still be able to buy stuff, mm -hmm. but it would limit it. Some suppliers wouldn't deal with you because they, they would be afraid of fines. They could just limit the scope of what crypto could do mm -hmm. to the point where then it becomes a question of, what is its value, right? Where does the, you know, if, if you can't use it, does it still have value? Yeah. Yeah. I asked that combination of questions because it doesn't appear to me possible to break out of this cycle of, you know, civilizational boom and bust into authoritarianism, authoritarianism, re rebellion, revolution, until so, we get really high integrity property of some kind, because otherwise they keep violating it through the monopolization of money. That's yeah, what keeps happening. We keep debasing around. the monetary protocol and then the society built on top of it collapses. Sure. That's the trap we've been in over and over and over again. You need a separation of state from money. I mean, that's my state from economics. Yes. That's the principle, right? So you need a separation of state from economics, but you're not going to get that, in my view, through technology. Well, okay. How you're do you get it? And you're only going to get it through I mean, ideas. Through, so, wait, through the constitution. Just, sorry to sorry to interrupt. Just no, right. could you maybe just elaborate on the constitutional element you're describing? How you keep the monopoly on force from just disregarding that at some point? Because it seems like you're like, you know, you're giving all the force to a monopolist, and then you're saying, "Don't touch yeah. the money, guy with the gun." The guy with the gun eventually is going to say, why am I listening to you? I've got the gun. Give me the money. Maybe, but maybe not, right? So it, if, if we, the people, right, you know, so, so take America, right? So America built this, a certain system in the 19th century that was flawed, but the best we've ever had, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it did pretty well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and money to a large extent was private for a big chunk of that period of time, although not completely private, the government still manipulated it, but for a lot. And that's with very, a very flawed document. Why? Why did presidents in the United States in the 19th century, for the most part, accept that limitation of power? Because they, they bought into the system. They were raised in the system. They realized the system was good for people. They also thought that if they violated it too badly, the people might lynch them, right? Mm. 
uh, whether they had the monopoly of the use of power or not, they might be lynched. So uh, if you if we get to the point where people accept the constitution, like I'm arguing, then the polit- politicians are secondhanders and not thinkers for themselves. The, you know, if, if, if people like that, people who would write a constitution like that wouldn't vote a Trump or Biden or Hillary Clinton into office. People like that would be considered, you know, for the gutter, not for the White House. The White House would be for people who believe in these ideas that the Constitution is about and are going to stick to it. And but it's ideas. My, my point is all of history is shaped by ideas. Mm-hmm. It's ideas about reason, for example, that kept us in servitude for thousands of years. Right. It's ideas about reason that liberated us. And the only way to truly liberate us is better ideas. And I think we've gone from Aristotle to, um, to John Locke, to the founding fathers, to Ayn Rand. Yeah. And in every one of these st- steps, we improve the set of ideas. Now, can I guarantee that if we establish such a constitution, it will, be, it will work forever? Of course not. Right. People can choose to ignore it. But if people get to the point where they're willing to accept a constitution like that, it will give us a few hundred years of unbelievable freedom that we've never seen on planet Earth the likes of. Mm. Right. I mean, if you if you have anarchy to mind, if you have, uh, you know, whatever, and 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 people decide they don't really want it, they want statism and they want authoritarianism and they're willing to give up their electricity for it then everything will collapse. So Mm -hmm. people can always make bad choices that destroy the world in which they live. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's excellent points. Um, And I guess, you know, I agree with you completely. It's all about ideas. I've I've written a piece. It's titled Our Most Brilliant Idea. And it's going through the history of, and actually trade being the generator of ideas. We come up with new ideas through trade. That's how it works. Um, And, it's see, like I, I mean, my, I agree with you, but I would add that Bitcoin is just an idea. Frankly, like when you boil it all the way down, it's just an idea. It it's is. like money and, that you can't steal from people. And and to the extent that that Bitcoin is used, or that or that the use of Bitcoin perpetuates that idea, mm-hmm. right? Then that's great. Then yeah. maybe that's part of the solution. It's not all the solution because you still have to have a moral code and you just have to have a political theory. Right. But a piece of that political theory is money you can't, st- property rights is a piece of that political theory. Yeah. And if that can spread through the use of Bitcoin, good. Then that's one idea that I don't have to lecture about. I can take for yes. granted. We can build on that. Right. But I'm dubious even of that because so many people out there who I see who are Bitcoin fans don't really see it that way. Right. They, they, they might be, um, they might be in it because they think it's cool. They might be in it because they, um, uh, you know, they, they're leftists generally. I know a lot of Bitcoiners are leftists who want to regulate my life in other respects, but somehow they want money to be free. But in uh, other ways, they want to control me. I don't it's know. very strange. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to put Bitcoiners in one homogenous group. Like they are across a political that's spectrum. My point, my point is, even though there's this element of solid thing at their base, Bitcoiners can be everything. Their, their education is not that education and that idea of private property is yeah. not filtered through the Bitcoin community to the extent that I would like it. And it's a fertile community. It's a community that I think the ideas of liberty have have a real foothold. We could really make hay in them, but in and of itself, it's not enough. It needs I, the education. It needs the philosophy. I mean, we're early days. Clearly, it's thirteen years in. Like. Weinstein made the point to even call it an institution after 13 years old is just silly because it needs, you need a lot more established history. Sure. But I'm like, I'm trying to look around the corner, which is even through the Bitcoin community itself. I have all my issues with the community, but I'm just looking at what is Bitcoin? What are these, these principles? What is this implementation of principle into reality in a way? And it, you know, at the end of the day, sure, it's not the solution to everything, but it definitely makes the immoral action of theft, at least less profitable. It's hard. Yes. It's more expensive to steal like full stop. So that is Good at thing. least pushing human action in the right direction. If you just look at it through a purely incentive lens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. It's something it's, it's, it's like, because a lot of people, like, even when you describe people, you say that these types of people are those types of people. I, I think that is secondary. Like the types of people is secondary to the primacy of incentives. Like if we could somehow make honesty pay right now, then a but lot honesty of people would does probably pay. be honest. But honesty does pay, but it pays in the long run. And, it, and to yeah. see that it pays requires thinking and people default on thinking and, and people default on thinking. So you, what you have to do is teach them how to think. And it's not that you have to teach everybody how to think. Right. You know, people, it's always going to be the case that people will go by incentives, yeah. that people will go by what they're taught. They'll go by the crowd in a sense. What we need is to capture the intellectual high ground. Yes. We need to become the teachers. Right. And if we can become the teachers, then everybody else will fall into place in a sense. Not fall into place authoritarian wise. They won't yes. be forced. Yeah. But they will fall into place because they'll get it. It'll well, just well, you're absolutely right. And Rothbard talks about this ideological battleground where the state has always tried to hijack the opinion molders, I think as he called them, so they can justify yeah, but statism. Yeah, but I think I think you know, in the American state to a large extent, I mean. I, I disagree with Rothbard about a lot of these things because I think the American state, for example, improved human life dramatically mm. over every one of the alternatives and and um, and made it better for a while, at least. Right. Mm. And uh, so is it really the state that is the problem? I don't think so. I think it's irrationality. Mm. I think it's unreason uh, that are the real enemies. The real enemy is is people who won't think or people who who who, who choose to destroy instead of to build it's 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 nihilism and irrationalism that are the enemy so when rothbard says the state it looks like he's looking without you're saying we need to look within it's actually our own irrationality that needs yes. to be reduced at the core everything is about morality and morality is about being rational mm. so become rational as a human being as an individual help other people become rational and the world will be a better place well said I'll read another excerpt here. We've been on a lot of tangents. I'm really enjoying this, but try to get us back to the virtue of selfishness. She writes, this is Rand writing, quote, observe the indecency of what passes for moral judgments today. An industrialist, an, an industrialist who produces a fortune and a gangster who robs a bank are regarded as equally immoral since they both sought wealth for their own, quote unquote, selfish benefit. Yeah. A young man who gives up his career in order to support his parents and never rises beyond the rank of grocery, grocery clerk is regarded as morally superior to the young man who endures an excruciating struggle and achieves his personal ambition. A dictator is regarded as moral since the unspeakable atrocities he committed were intended to benefit the quote unquote people, not himself. So... Yeah, I mean, this, it's like, okay, again... It is moral to improve, to pursue your own self-interest up to That's the boundary morality. of someone else's self-interest, basically. But interests shouldn't really conflict, right? My, my self-interest doesn't really conflict with your self-interest. Well, they have to conflict in the market, right? If there's one Leonardo da Vinci painting and there's 50 million people that want it, we have to bid it out or fight it out. Uh, it's not a conflict, right? We, 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 some of us will get it, some of us won't. One of us will get it. Others will not. But the, the, the reason is an objective reason. The person who got it paid more for it. Um, I'm happy, right? Because I kept the money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it, it's not that I lost. It, I, yeah, I never had the Leonardo da Vinci, right? So, yeah. um, you know, you, you might, two people might go for a job. There's only one job opening. One gets it, one doesn't. Well, you didn't get it because the other person was more qualified. It was never yours and you lost it. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you, you didn't qualify for it. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else did. So the whole conception of conflict needs to change. You know, we, we live in a society, we don't live in a zero-sum world. Your success is not my loss. Mm -hmm. And the focus of morality is success. The, the whole point of all those examples she gives is, uh, we live in a culture that views self-interested activity as evil and selfless activity as good. Mm -hmm. And she's flipping it. She's saying, no, self-interested activity is good. Selfless mm -hmm. activity is evil. Hmm. Be self-interested. Now, that doesn't mean 
stomp on other people because that's not self-interest. Not really, not in the moral mm-hmm. sense and not in the political sense. It's never in your interest to stomp on other people unless it's self-defense. And then, you know, if somebody stump to stomp you, stomp them back first, right? Mm-hmm. Don't turn the other cheek. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, there are always going to be people who, people who are immoral, people who are going to try to abuse you. Don't let them. Right. And if there is one role, for, the one role of government is to prevent them from doing it to the extent that they can. Well, wow, okay. So it is self selfishness up to the point of life, liberty, and property of others. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I want to live the best, but this is the way I think about it. I want to live the best damn life I can live for me. And I know that violating other people's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is not good for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm fine with it. It's not, right. a, it's not something I have to resist. It's something I have to think, I really yeah. want to steal that. Yeah, but no, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to because I'm going to go to jail. I don't want to ever steal something. Why would I ever want to steal something, right? I'm living for me. Stealing is the opposite of living for me. Stealing yes. makes me dependent on you because you produced it. I'm stealing it from you. I'm that's a recogni- I'm announcing to the world I can't take care of myself. Yeah. I have to take from you, right? It's so, it's like the weakest thing a man, a human being could do. Yeah. No, I completely agree. So it is, she is, I mean, she is very much a pioneer in the sense that she's attempting to because most people get their moral guidance from something like the bible or some other religious tradition but she's trying to pull that sort of inherently subjective domain into some objective anchor points absolutely she's trying to produce an art from an is yeah wow and the and the is is human nature the is is the nature of reality the is is what leads to happiness and the art is the things that actually lead to those things. They're things yes. that actually use that outcome. Okay. One last question, and then we can, we'll save it for the next one. <laughs> We've Good. been all over the, the world today. I just, there's this question kind of burning in my mind here about mathematics. Yep. Um, is mathematics the ultimate abstraction in a way? Because what I'm thinking is, you know, it's such a universal language. You can use it to describe anything that it has the quality of threeness or fiveness or sevenness, whatever it is. And I ask because if it is, then it seems to me like the more sophisticated we become in mathematics, that would be the, the way to quantify our reason in a way. So if we're going to try to quantify the reasonableness of civilization, would it be something like how sophisticated we are in mathematics? Not necessarily, but but there's a there is a link. It's not one on one. It's not it's not relational in that sense. Mathematics is an abs, is an abstraction. It, it it's it's a way for us to describe reality in an abstract way, and in a generalizable way. Mm-hmm. So if I say three, that's three things. It could be three bottles. It could be three fingers. It could be three giraffes. Mm-hmm. But I've abstracted away from what the thing is mm-hmm. to just three, right? And that's it. That's a beautiful abstraction. Mm-hmm. Rand thinks that mathematics is deeply embedded in the way we form concepts mm. and in the way we think. That is that we think we, we abstract. Uh, she would connect abstraction to algebra mm. um, and the concept formations to algebra. And uh, and she was starting to study actually calculus because she thought calculus was related to how we form propositions. Hmm. And so that, so she definitely thought that there was a relationship between this abstract form in which we describe reality and the way we think in words, hmm. in concepts, mm-hmm. that those were related somehow. And she was working on that. Um, you know, she was taking math lessons, you know, in her 70s when, when before she died, wow. just before she died, because she was convinced that there was a relation between mathematics and epistemology. And to understand all the epistemological nuances, you had to know mathematics, which is fascinating. And I wish somebody would pick up on her re- research and do, do the work because it really is interesting. Um, you should read, if you're interested in this, uh, there's a book called uh, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology which is her uh, introduction to epistemology. And she talks about math in there and the relationship between math and concept formation. 
um, in algebra and concept formation. And it's fascinating. It really is interesting. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Well, maybe that's why the question was burning on my mind. It was just, yeah, I, did, I had no idea that she had that, had she yep. had done that work. So. Yeah. Hey guys, I hope you found this episode valuable. At the What Is Money Show, we are striving to deliver the most valuable knowledge possible in each and every episode. However, as Aristotle said, the purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. So I hope you're deriving some useful knowledge from the show, and I hope it's improving the actions you are taking in your life. Speaking of action, if you want to dive deeper into the big ideas explored in this show, please sign up for my newsletter titled The Freedom Analex at breedlove22.substack.com. Also, have you bought your tickets for Bitcoin 2022 in Miami yet? If not, it's your lucky day as I am giving away 10 million sats, which is roughly 4,000 US dollars to one lucky person who buys a conference ticket through my affiliate link. My affiliate link can be found on my Twitter profile at breedlove22, um, which also has a link. My Twitter profile has a link to my link tree, which you can also visit my link tree directly for links to all my work, including Bitcoin 2022 affiliate cells. My link tree is l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e backslash breedlove22. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys watching the show. I hope you're finding some valuable knowledge in the What Is Money show, and I'll see you back here again next time.